flat land like a man on the run, riding down Highway 61. Sides of the roads all lined with fields, nothing but sunset in the windshield. As I ride into town, this is where I go to slow down. Miles and miles of soybeans and corn, I'm in the place where the blues was born. What's up guys, Brad Chapel back at the Crappie Expo, Birmingham, Alabama, sweet home, Alabama. It's a great event, beautiful weather outside, getting some people inside the building too. I've got two really great guests today and I'm gonna let them do a little introduction with each other. You probably know the guy on the right already. He's been on a couple podcasts with me and we've teamed up with some things, but go ahead and Gabe and spill the beans. Gabe Sewell with uh, Crappie Forever. Uh, here hanging out with Brad and enjoying the expo. Yep. Go ahead, and, Kevin. Oh, thanks, Brad. Hey, Gabe. Uh, my name is Kevin Dockendorf. I'm with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. I'm a fisheries biologist in the coastal plain of North Carolina. I uh, deal mostly with resident fish, bass, crappie, catfish. Had the opportunity to come here and chat with Gabe and have the opportunity to chat with you all today. Yeah, man, definitely appreciate you. Everybody loves these podcasts when it comes to the, you know, the science even end of things when it comes to crappie fishing and, you know, if people really didn't love crappie fishing, it wouldn't be an expo today. And it wouldn't be this many people coming in here to check out crappie fishing stuff. So without you guys doing the research, protecting our resources, both sides of me really, this kind of thing wouldn't happen as far as the expo and crappie fishing industry and even the crappie connection. So a big thank you on the crappie connection side of things to you as well, Game, and also you, Kevin, for what you do. So it... it it takes work from a lot of people to make it keep going. Absolutely, and, and it's really that it comes down to the anglers, especially with crappy federal aid and sport fish restoration, as you all well know, excise taxes that uh, are, are within the fishing rods and reels and those types of things, the baits, the, the depth finders, and all of that. The angler is supporting, so it's a you know user pay, user benefit opportunity. Right, it's a big circle here. It is. It's a big connection. It's a huge connection. Man, look at how you do that. That's yeah, great. I kind of so, let in that one, didn't yeah, I? You did. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I want to talk about a couple of different things today. And like I said, I've got Gabe here and also Kevin uh, on the conservation side of things. And we want to have both of you kind of give some opinions and some thought process or even some factuals when it comes to conservation, when it comes to the, the crappie, black crappie, white crappie, hybrid crappie, all of the crappie. All of it. All of it. We want uh, them all. Okay. That sounds great. You want Go ahead, cool. Kevin. Go ahead and start. Oh, I appreciate it, Gabe. Well, I just want to kind of give a connection back to where Gabe and I kind of started talking about yeah. this. And the opportunity where um, actually a fellow biologist, Adam Martin from Kentucky, uh, uh, Gabe had contacted him as well and so we had done a uh, crappy symposium in Norfolk, Virginia last year that it was about continuing the conversation about crappy biology, crappie biology, management and where do we go from here. And a lot of these topics that were out there of what we know about them, what we don't know about them were a big part of that meeting. So the opportunity to continue that conversation here, talk more about where are we at in that biology and management and conservation of these species. So it's really important. Crappy are huge 
uh, fishery here in the southeast. Um, of course, I'm from North Carolina, but know so many folks from Alabama, Mississippi, and uh, Florida, uh, where I got my master's degree. So in crappy. So um, I've been at uh, this for a little bit, but just absolutely love uh, to talk about crappy. If we want to talk about their spawning activity, yeah, we want to hear it. Um, you all know it by fishing them. You know, I mean, you're, you know the cycles, you know that these fish are a matter of patterns and behaviors. And uh, water temperature is a big thing, I suppose, with about every single fish, right? Because they're cold-blooded animals, so every change in that water temperature affects them. Pressure in the water affects them. So you all are cognizant of all, you know, what's going out there. And the opportunity to chat with you all about that, to communicate that, digest, talk about the biology so I don't get too fish nerdy on you, <laughs> uh, too, too much fish science, yeah. but let's break this down a little bit. Where can we, where can we talk about that? So at the, it's a great opportunity to today to learn uh, is really why I'm here yeah. as to how we can do better. We, you know, we rely on you guys just as you rely on us to give you information. And, you know, we want yep. some information on your side of things to know kind of some of the thought process. Uh, how do you guys go about looking at a lake and breaking it down as far as the status of a lake that would be really interesting to me how would you say this is a good fishery or it's a herd fishery or what well you know a lot of it is comes back to networking and talking with folks about what we already know about the system what do we know and and as far as biologists we're bit, we're boiling it down to three things recruitment growth and mortality and then that's an equation that then yields whatever that angler yield can be we look at those for our regulations, the regulations that we set if there's need be, or maybe there's doesn't need to be a regulation based on those parameters. Also, what is the angler harvest that's occurring at the time? So when we go out and do angler surveys, we have the opportunity to learn about what the catch is, how many you're catching, what size, if you're harvesting them, if we can actually see them. And that's called a dependent survey. That, that survey is dependent upon what the anglers are doing. And then the other side of it is the independent surveys, meaning we as the biologists are going out there to get a, a robust sample as best we can of the age zeros in the system to the age fours to the age sevens. How big are they at those ages? And then um, there's the, the factor of mortality. How many are dying? How quickly they're dying? Um, we as biologists speak of boom or bust populations that these crappies can go through because the recruitment, the environmental factors that are so significant to that early life history. It's all set on one, you know, that first year and when they're born. My master's degree was uh, at University of Florida looking at three lakes, looking at all of that young a year from seven millimeters all the way up to the fall of that system and finding them and what they're eating. And it's really amazing. Each lake is different as yeah. to what that is. I can believe that because every lake is so different even on how we catch them. <laughs> you know, you can't use one technique and one bait and go to every lake yeah. out there and catch them. Yeah. Uh, now, with the aid of live scope, it's changed that formula yeah. some. Yeah. But still, even with that aid of that equipment, there's different things that you've got to do to catch fish in different lakes. So I definitely see. But I, I'm kind of interested in that first year. Yeah. What are some of the factors to help you know, conservate that year class to get older because that's what we want them. We want them to be able to harvest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you have something? Well, no. So I was gonna say I remember from the Lake Washington guys talking. You know, the how much effect do other species of fish when we're talking about that? Yep. Like, because they were talking about yep. there's a lot of white bass in Lake Washington now, yep. and so that's yep. a huge factor, right? As yep. far as what? Right. And so you know, that's a good point. Is like all those factors I was calculating is not in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an ecosystem of that system that then influences every uh, uh, fish, plant that's out there. Uh, you know, is, it, is there a lot of nutrients or is there limited nutrients? So when you ask about, you know, well, that first year, what do we want to know about that first year? That's a great way to kind of start that cycle, mm -hmm. you know, where the fish are going to be spawning. If they're in that system, they're going to, the males, um, like most centrarchids, they're the ones that are the nest builders. And so they are moving in, they're feeling that temperature, and it, it, it doesn't have to be the exact 60 and 68, but as it's warming up, that's what they're suiting up for, right? That 
tuxedo that they're getting ready for, that coloration that they're getting ready for, they're getting ready to be on that nest to attract a female into that nest who has the eggs and then they'll fertilize that. So when, uh, when that's all said and done, then the male guards that nest for a period of time, right? So you, you're, you're keeping that in the back of my, your minds when you're all out there fishing for right. it. Um, but the female's a big part of that, the eggs that come from that. It could be smaller females with fewer eggs, big females with lots of eggs. So those are you know critical factors in that reproduction component of it. We talked about temperature, we talked about food, and that's really another big part of it, is once those fish are, leave the nest as fry balls and get out in the water and it's water temperature. Um, we have studies done that show peaks of larval fish and then they just crash out because the water temperature may have been too cold. But it was a, it was a potential early spawn versus a later spawn. And uh, there's opportunity there to look at the risk reward to say, well, if the first uh, fish that are spawned, they get the first uh, in line at the buffet of right. what's out there, or maybe the buffet is not ready yet. And so then that larval re recruitment isn't necessarily there. Um, or that it's, even if it's abundant, it needs to be available. Turbidity is a big part of your water quality and what we talk about uh, a lot on how y'all set up to find those fish and what they're gonna bite on. To see what they're biting on is a big thing. Um, so, you know, what they feed on and forage on, they move through the system over time, the spring, the summer, and the fall. So I'm just talking about even just the starting, the recruits, uh -huh. just moving through that and they grow based on that food that they're in. Now the mothers and fathers, the males and females, the ones that spawned them, they went through that cycle as well. If we come back to that ecosystem, they're going through that entire aquatic web each and every time. So as age one, age two, age three, but only so many of them make it to get to that reproduction. So when we talk about length limits and those types of things, that's what we're looking at is can we get 50% of the females old enough, mature enough to then keep that population going? And if it's not there, then a regulation may be important. If, if, if they can't get there, then maybe, um, or they can and it's fine, maybe there's no need for a regulation. There's a lot of them or something like that. They right. can't even grow high, you know, big enough. So that's really what we're trying to do is learn that system learn more about their biology, apply the general factors, but then what is it system specific? And to Gabe's point, what could be competitors, um, prey versus uh, uh, predators in that system? What about comrades? I know around the southern parts, we have, in the winter time, <clears throat> seems like just an abundance of comrades. How, how much can that affect that lake in the ecosystem wise? Well, um, you know, the, the avian predation is big. We've got blue herons. We've got, you know, uh, the cormorants that are fish eating specifically. And, um, you know, even largemouth bass or other big fish in that system, it's all coming down to, like, gape limitation. What's that population of those birds or those predators in relation to, to what the prey base is? And eventually the cormorants are probably eating the fish of the size that are age ones. Mm -hmm. But eventually, H2, H3, H4s, they're bigger. So we're talking, you know, 10, 12, 15 inch fish. Cormorants aren't doing anything to those necessarily, um, but the, they are to the, maybe to the recruits. But you talk about maybe Lake Washington or others that I'm totally not yeah, familiar with. Right. But just saying, what else is out there that cormorants, that, that they're fish eating birds? So are there other fish that they're eating as well? It, 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 it is without checking the diets and knowing the populations, but that's their habits. I mean, they're fish-eating birds, ospreys, herons, you know, but ospreys and cormorants are fish-specific eating birds. Fish-eating machines, <laughs> yeah. like to me. I mean, you see them out there and it's kind of like a combine coming across the field. There's so many of them, um, but they, they could be a really big factor on a, a lake then. On, on a lake that has uh, limited recruitment, yeah. Uh, where, you know, so you would think that if the population is there enough for to, the cormorants can eat them, you know, there must be a lot of them for it to stay there. But at the same time, we really don't know what that initial factor is, at what time are they there, you know, what system is it that the gross, are they that big or are they these yeah. big ones? But, I know even on some of the bigger fish in the past, I have seen, you know, 15, 16 inch fish 
in, and I'm talking early spring, February, March, in that time frame, January, that have big marks on the side of them. It yep. looks like bird. I would assume, or I've always assumed, that would be comrades. It, it could be. Now another, do you have long-nosed gar That's what I was uh, gonna say, in the gar. system? It's interesting that, you know, where I fish in coastal plain in North Carolina, uh, you can see gar activity, and then crappy sometimes are right underneath there. And what I think, and I don't know this, this is just speculation on yeah. my part, but, you know, long-nosed gar aren't going to necessarily eat the fish, but they're interested in those eggs, you know, and maybe they're interested in eating those eggs uh, coming out, and they're trying to make that, you know, eggs drop out for them to take a bite from. Uh, gar's mouths are, look, they look big, but they're relatively small as to what they can do. But to wrap it up into what the biology is and those calculations, when we see mortality and we look at the uh, how what how crappy are dying in a system, it bases on fishing and natural mortality. Those additions are called total mortality. So what's happening if it's cormorants, if it's anglers, it's total mortality that we can then look, look into the calculations of that to say how bad of a problem is it for the population. You know, that if the population has a, you know, really heavy mortality rate, is it anglers, is it cormorant, is it other predators in that system or does it happen early on what about and i don't know it just seems like in the last 10 years i've noticed a lot more pelicans really hmm. i mean really a, a lot of pelicans do they prey on crappie as well well i, I think it's uh, to what they can forage on and their behaviors where if they're diving in and seeing that and gripping them up and having them in there and then can they swallow them um, you know, if you got populations of other fishes out there, there's a good chance that they're diving in on those and sweeping those up as well. So in some cases, it's, it's their behavior, and the result it might be fish from that system that maybe not specifically one or the other, right. but, you know, it's a fish-eat-fish fish world out there. And so <laughs> maybe this gets, a, you know, fish eat little fish and birds eat fish. And, you know, what we're doing is watching that behavior in those systems and trying to inform that. And then, you know, with all of those, how are the anglers uh, doing out there? Is it a good thing? Do we need more co conservative efforts? Do we need to do other things if the mortality rates are so high that it doesn't support uh, those populations like it once did? I know another thing kind of comes to my mind. What what would be in your mind one of the most common factors to cause a bad spawn? <clears throat> well, as I mentioned earlier, and I know there's a wide range. It, of things. Yeah, the water temperature. You know, um, you would hope that you know through time the water temperature is going to increase. But you know, say you do have a cold spring and the fish are attempting to spawn multiple times. If they do lose one, then the nest is still there, and you know the males, the females could come in at varying rates. Um, so, so that could happen. We also know that water level changes are, are significant, right? Yeah. So that you know, depending on the setup, is it a dry year, a wet year, is it a variable year? That variable recruitment is a big part of what crappy dynamics, what we keep talking yeah. about, erratic recruitment. So, and as you said, it could be a broad yeah. uh, component of things, trying to stay in the microphone there, but it could be a broad uh, aspect of things, and that's what we try to learn from previous trends and where we've had good year classes and where we've had poor ones and kind of ma match that up. And it's every system is, is specific to its own needs and those types of things. I mean, we could chat about environmental variables for the entire podcast yeah. and say what happened to your lake what happened to your lake and each lake would be deserving of a discussion of the springtime that summer the fall even a hard winter um ice over could be a factor uh in certain systems now where i grew up in iowa ice over is a part of it right so but when you come to the south ice is not a part of it but it can have that film but that what that means is it got super cold so it was cold enough to get ice on there. So does that start that process later for the fish spawning activity? And then, and, then, and then swap that out to say what makes good recruitment. Some of those things line up to be great things. Because you hear a lot about the big four, uh, Grenada especially, because all these core lakes, that water fluctuation, and you hear a lot of people attribute bad spawns at Grenada, in particular year. on a low water year. Yes. 
and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it, it's quite possible. I mean, and I don't know the biology as well there as my counterparts may do. But where the fish spawn, do they stabilize and always stay in a spot that is good spawning area, or is those water levels affecting where they spawn? And I guess it would depend on you know how fast the water falls out. But it seems to me that I've noticed the past couple of years, some of the lakes that I fished, we would have a, a, a high water spring. And naturally, I think that should be a great spawn. And it actually had a kind of the opposite effect of, of that lake. Yeah, it's interesting, right? I mean, those are kind of the things we're trying to work with and understand, like, well, it should have been high. You all said yeah. if we had high water, we'd have good. Well, okay, what else happened? You know, you said about how fast something drops out. Well, so if that if the nest was there and had eggs in it and you know it dropped out fast is that going to have opportunity to spawn or or not you know even though they had successful spawning maybe it had poor survival at the egg stage all right once a fish goes in there lays eggs and the male does his part how long before that point do they actually hatch and become fried well, that's, that's a great great question, as it does uh, be with water temperature. So, um, But one to two days, one to three days, if it's relatively warm. The cooler days, it might take them longer. But the, 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 the opportunity for those eggs to hatch usually is between one and three days. And then larval survival is another factor of that. Even though that egg has hatched, now how long is that larvae going to survive in that fry zone? And how does it get out into the... That's my next question I'm going <laughs> toward is, all right, they've hatched. Three days later, yep. Will they leave? Will they stay in that nest? And how long will, will they be in that nest before they leave? Yeah, and agree. my next side, when it comes to conservation, is it better to take that male off or catch the female and take her off? Oh well. So the the male is going to guard that nest for while it has eggs in the nest. And, and in that, you know, attraction moment, there could be multiple females coming in and off of that nest. And there could be a congregation of thousands of male crappie in around that area where they're spawning. So, I mean, where, you know, the springtime fishing is where those fish are actively guarding the nest and trying to keep things off and you're catching them. But maybe the fry have already, that have successfully spawned and they're now migrating in the waves and going on. So it's kind of that whole system of that. To answer your question as to which ones to, to harvest, you know, it's kind of like, well, is harvest the priority? Or are you out there catching and learning and, you know, having the opportunity to move on to other spots? Are you looking for size? Are you looking for something to fry up in the limit or not limit? Those types of things. So um, it all does kind of come back to the angler preference. And, and opportunity of what those uh, ones are. But whether you whether you harvest the male or the female, you know, it's it's a 50-50 as to what that fish is. And for you to look at it, you wouldn't necessarily know it's a male or a female without that coloration or... And it depends on, you know, what stage they're at too, right? Because yeah. they don't all do it at the same time. Right. So right. you're right. going to have males doing one thing up there that other ones are doing different and right. females aren't laying eggs yet and some of them are. And right, and we're talking one spot of the lake or environment, river or wherever you're at and then like I said, another spot might be and then so there could be some staging going on and, and even the females, they're going to lay their eggs at different times uh, as well, just depending on when they're ready to lay those eggs. And so right. what's the most important, so not only water temperature, but like day length, right? Like the amount of daylight, daylight. Does it, isn't that a big photo factor period, as yeah. well? Photo period is what we what we often refer that to, and that just kind of helps with that, you know, warming those water temperatures and they're queued up. Um, it's interesting because, you know, um, if you have cloud cover versus a sunny day, it's a little bit different. But I really think that, you know, the opportunities to be out there and seeing where they spawn, when they spawn, and that trend. Does that happen year in and year out? Or do you as anglers see them in different areas doing different things? And that's important because we don't really get in that detail very often except if we do those research projects like that. And they often say that, you know, crappy have these, their nests, but they don't look like a bluegill nest. They don't, they don't have these saucer well-defined areas, even, you know, sitting in the treetop or something like that, somewhere that it's guarding that nest, but it could be uh, anywhere. 
yep. really. Right. So um, they're they're so good with that larval re recruitment, why they're called boom and bust, and why sometimes they can just be very good at spawning and recruitment, but the growth, the system may not allow for great growth to a memorable or a trophy size just because it's so productive. So each system has its own story, you know, and that's kind of what I'd like to dive into with you all about that is yeah. like, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? And then, you know, inform, innovate, and entertain. Well, I can help with information and try to be innovative. I don't know about entertaining, but... <laughs> You're doing you know, a great job, trust you know, me. You, you, guys are, you guys are great, and uh, just getting that word out and showing how great these fisheries are yeah. and understanding those biology in that it's not just a spring fishery either. Yeah, it absolutely. could happen over summer, it could happen fall, it could happen winter. You know, so really what we're trying to do as biologists is help the angler in the way we do help communicate that and do it this way. So we don't know it all but we can apply a little bit of the general biology to help kind of keep that story going. I know a, a question I've got for you myself is if you had a uh, fishery and you felt like it was hurt and it was a knowledge that it was hurt yep. and you're wanting to protect those younger fish, whether it's from white bass or comrades, would it be really beneficial to that lake to add structure to it, especially in that mid to deeper depth range and would it be thick or thin what would be the ideal structure to help a fishery in a lake to promote that age class to get older and bigger so it wouldn't have that problem with predators and i want to tack on to that too so like at grenada and some of the other lakes up there the core and uh, we're going to help with it a lot this year through crappie forever but they have those habitat days right so on those years when that water's fluctuating, part of the reason that we're doing that is to put brush piles and stuff in Grenada, because Grenada, there's not a lot of structure in it. Okay. So like, if those fish don't have a place, if the water's down out of the bushes or wherever they normally do, will they just not spawn? Or will they try to find something out in the lake that is like that, that we're putting in there? Will they spawn on that? Well, I think if we come back to the behavior of the fish and their biology is that they're, they're, at, they're males and females with eggs that are growing in them, probably even in the wintertime as that water temperature is queuing up. And once those eggs are ready to go, they're going to want to put them somewhere and they're going to go through that behavior. And so they'll go to locations to attempt those, those spawns. It's whether it's successful spawn or where it's located at. You know, structure's great because all, all sizes really do do well at it because they can be in that moment of attack and other little prey species are going to come around that structure to do that. As far as the, um, you know, if they get a successful spawn off, then those uh, fry are off out into the water and into the water columns. And so um, a lot of times that's in the wind drift because that's where the zooplankton and those uh, type of uh, animals are at, that those little larval uh, crappy fry are eating on, as well as bluegill fry, as well as bass fry. And it's the window of when they have spawned and how they can win in that battle of the buffet of that time frame. And then because they're really just swimming with the wind, a lot of times that's their habit is to just drift with that wind and stay with the zooplankton because the zooplankton's just in the water. It's interesting though, I did see a study once that they had zooplankton in a little Petri dish and um, they were just going around in the water. And I was like, boy, these things are just sitting ducks, you know. Well, then also in the, um, and I'll, I'm doing bad about the who I would you know, give credit to, but I just remember it. They, we put a little pheromone, crappy pheromone, dropped it into that Petri dish where the zooplankton were. Those zooplankton shot out and went away, and it was amazing that those zooplankton went into hyperactive mode to get away from that smell uh, of a crappy. Wow. So, so to think that it's act, you know, so that's why that early life history, even in that dynamic, they're seven and fifteen millimeters in size, and there's a whole world out in that just that water column. So the habitat that's available to and the food that's available to those larval crappy and setting them up in that first year, the food base is really critical to that growth. 
as far as what putting structure out for spawning and that type of stuff, it's just hard to say that you're going to find the right spot at the right time with the right temperature. And kind of, you know, we need to learn from the anglers as to where you're fishing and where they're at and then what are those types of habitats that they're actually doing well in and if it's a problem. As you said, if it has been diagnosed a problem, right. then we still need to look at that mortality rate and you know determine what is going on. Use those biology components, get our hands on those adult fish, and then you know other studies uh, to help inform what is the problem and how can we fix that. Pretty cool stuff. <laughs> now, one of the things that sticks out to me from one of the first podcasts I remember watching, and one of the first things that I'll never forget that I'd never dreamed of is that these fish will spawn out in deep water as well, like in Barnett on all the stumps and all that stuff. Dale and I have been fishing in Barnett and caught fish in the spring that are out just roaming with nothing, and there's just eggs falling out of them. You know, I mean, I've always thought that that was yeah, just crazy. You know, a thing that I've noticed, and I wanted to bring this up along with this this bone subject here, is this past bone on the lake that I got on fish, you know, probably 200 days a year. Lucky this, guy. <laughs> it's terrible. But uh, <laughs> it seems to me that this bone started the first week of March, and I think it's really good for the lake when I say this, but our spawn really didn't win wind up ending towards the end of May. It's very long periods of spawn. And yes. then I've been to fisheries or lakes that it might last for two or three weeks. Yeah. So it's, but I think longer the spawn would be better for the lake. Well, and that's called protracted spawning. Uh, sunfish, what crappie and bass and the sunfish populations are, is they're taking advantage of those opportunities that are out there for those systems. And it's the proverbial, don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? Mm -hmm. So that extended spawning timeline is the, that opportunity for whatever reason, the water temperature's staying right, the photo period's good, the food base, whatever, they're extending that to optimize that recruitment. Because if they were the only species, that's what they're trying to be. But in, in the lakes and those types of things where there's other species out there, it's still a battle out there, right? Fish eat fish world, as I said said earlier. But yeah, that each lake is different. Each season's di spawning season is different. Mm -hmm. um, matter of fact, um, um, when I was in Florida, um, I worked in um, Loch Lusa, Tarpon, and Wahlberg. But Orange Lake um, was actually um, had a, um, it drained from a sinkhole. And it was uh, completely drained out, couldn't get onto the lake. Eventually that sinkhole filled back in naturally, and um, the, the water started filling in the fall. And we noticed these small crappie. The, the biologists noticed small crappie in there, and they said, well, you're working on crappie. What is happening here? And we pulled the otoliths, the ear stones, where you can tell age. Yeah. And not only do we do, can we do annually, we can also do daily rings on fish of that size. Wow. So, Crazy. So we took that and we counted back um, to number of days as to when that spawning event would occur. And it would be, the, the spawning event would have had to occur in the fall. So when Ooh. that, when the, yeah, so the adults were there and they took that opportunity of that lake filling and they spawned um, and had what we deemed off-season spawning for that population. And so it, it, it opens up that question about how these fish are so reactive, so adaptive to their surroundings, and why they have these boom and bust populations, erratic recruitment, variable recruitment, because it could just be the water quality alone that's driving those, that first step. And then growth and other opportunities that way that could run that i know uh one of the smoking guns in the crappie fishing industry and a lot of valid concerns from gabe myself crappie forever crappie connection and a lot of different people is the aid and the usage of live scope yes front facing sonar front yes. facing sonar live yeah. sonar yeah what do you see changes that will have to take place to keep up with this technology 
Well, um, I'll just start by saying one of the great opportunities to come to the Crappy Expo today is to talk with y'all and anglers and learn more about where those concerns are at. What kind of tests could we do to learn more about that and, and develop things that you know help us see what's going on, similar to what y'all see in the water. What opportunities do we have to help understand what effects those nuances could bring? It's often a question is, well, how bad is it? Is it population level? Is it, you know, just if it's that one tournament or what, what is it really? And one thing about research scientists is we have, we're asking the question and then how do we, you know, break it down to then say, is this a major problem or is it just something that's just new and, you know, we'll get through it like we have on other things. One thing when you're on that precusp of any of that stuff is you don't have any answers other than let's talk about it and but let's put conservative measures in place to you know be aware of what isn't already there is it a fishery that does already have a length limit or doesn't it you know and those types of things and then in the advent of the front-facing sonar is there actually things we can do and learn from it as well uh, but mostly it's going to be talking to the anglers and when I was at the opportunity to be at the tournament yesterday where we saw a bunch of fish, but we couldn't catch them. Well, I know there's also different times when you see a bunch of fish and you catch a bunch of fish. Yeah. And so, you know, we kind of, you know, and, and not to come across as, you know, that we all learn from depth finders. We've learned from water temperatures and all of the electronics that have come this way. It's just such a great opportunity to learn together. Um, and what y'all are doing to tag fish, to learn more about them. It helps us that we want to help you. And we want to help know more about that population because we are all interested in the conservation of those uh, important resources and that we see uh, sustainability through time. Those are the ultimate goals I think everybody here today agrees upon. Yeah. And by finding that common ground, then we work together to then say, in this system, will we have an issue? In this system, will we have an issue? So I really don't have a good answer other than learning more about it is important. And we have other folks that have been doing some work and comparing live scope versus non-live scope. I personally don't, you know, use live scope and I've had great opportunities, but it's taken me a while to learn <laughs> all of that. But from what I hear, it can really uh, shrink that learning curve right. when it comes to finding fish, when it comes to those types of things. You know, you try to look for those pros that it gets more people out on the water. Maybe their day isn't as long. Maybe they actually find the fish and, you know, they're able to get back to the boat ramp, have a fun day and go out. Others, you know, we need to learn more about what could be a threat to these populations. And it is really no different than a cormorant that might have a threat, that a live scope might have a threat from facing sonar. But what are the threats to the populations? And does it just count towards mortality? Yeah. Or is there something that we can offset if it is too high? Like in a situation that, that anglers are noticing that a lake is decreasing in the overall volume of a fishery. Right. What would be some of the, the things that these anglers need to kind of focus on their side of things, but relaying to their local biologist? Yes. And, and what are some of the information you guys would say, hey, maybe I need to actually take a look at this. I'm getting more than one person's calls and concerns yep. because they see this happen. That, that, that's really the, the, the opportunity to network and communicate what's going on. And come back to what do we know and it was this and we, that's why we have the creel surveys at times sometimes we don't always have those but if we did it's about gathering as much information as we have and then trying to you know have the conversation with the anglers about here's what we know and here's why and here's what we don't know and what can we learn together but it's hard, you know, oh, I mean, I it, it's hard to get that everyone calling because, you know, it's like also like, well, I see one alligator, but I got 10 phone calls. Mm -hmm. Is that 10 alligators or is that one alligator? So, you know, it, 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 it has to be that kind of, you know, get it out there. What's that system? And then us for have the opportunity to have uh, communication with a point person, um, you know, that is kind of a part of that uh mode and you know every state is different in how they do their uh, fisheries biology and the schedules they're on and the rules and regulations and those types of cycles and the information 
relatively overload at times, but also limited because we are looking at fish populations that they only might get a chance to be out there two, three, four, you know, years at a time, and then we cycle to another location. And that could be just within the erratic recruitment of crappie, you know, crappie. Sorry, I, I use I use them both interchangeably. You can say it. <laughs> We're in Alabama. You can say it here. <laughs> so, um, but but it is just coming back to when there's a problem where if an angler says, "Why are we doing it this way?" I really don't see that. Well, that's what we want to open up those doors about and communicate with the biologists and have opportunity to talk about that. Um, we've had many times where there's a regulation concern or there's a population concern, and the better uh, where it works, but works better is getting to the biologists and communicating those concerns and then trying to develop a, um, a platform of sorts to everybody come to that uh, area to talk about that one particular issue and try try to stay on that particular issue. You know, and the biggest thing about like not moving fish and we want this fishery in this location, please. We just, we can't do that, but we can have the opportunity to talk about what is possible in these systems? What are the growths? Do, has it just changed because of three bad year classes? Or could there be high mortality high rates related to uh, fishing mortality? We don't know until we look. And that's all lake specific too. It is. You know, I mean, small lakes yeah. versus big lakes and different types of habitat and water clarities. And yeah. And I'm talking so generally yeah. because it's so vast as to what could be that, again, where you say a smoking gun, it's very difficult to actually say it's one thing. But in some cases, there's been a lot um, of activity that we've been able to hone in on to maybe say, well, we've ruled out those. Now is there something new? that we have it because we're going to always learn so a research question is always to learn something not just reinvent the wheel and say yeah we got it figured out because we don't right i, I, I know <laughs> I mean, that, that there's no you know set in stone perfect solution for any body of water you know one might not work the same as it right. would in the other body right. of water right. because there's so many factors that's yeah. out of our control and it's just the way it is Yes, and yeah, out of our control, if it's an environmental factor right. and we've got three cold years in a row versus like, hey, you know, our data shows that these fish are leaving the system before they have a chance to spawn. Now, that's that was the, you know, many of the premises of a length limit and a bag limit, you know, is too many are leaving for a chance to spawn. If they don't get old enough to spawn, they're not going to spawn. So an eight inch limit where I'm from is that the fish made it to age two, 50% of those females were deemed mature. And so therefore they have the opportunity to get there. The other, other thing that we have going on in the coastal plain of North Carolina is hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And right now with Ophelia and we, this, this time of year is really a challenge, but if fish kills occur, I mean, that take out with no oxygen, it doesn't matter the size of the fish, they can't breathe. Um, except for bowfin and gar and some other species that have adapted to those scenarios. But when we lose those fish at the population level like that, having the opportunity to have a length limit does allow those fish to spawn and at least have two years without the potential of them being harvested. So in a way, that's also kind of a fallback of not only it takes them a while to get old enough to spawn, but in the event of a catastrophe as we have in the coastal plain, an eight inch length limit gives an opportunity for those fish to spawn. So they need to be two years old, three years old to actually become into that breeding system. Well, for that, for the length that the length that age is another part of that lake specific component. Right. So when you talk to a, you know, when we're talking with the biologists and those types of things, we, we need to share how long does it take to get a fish to a certain size. And so like the conversations I've had with Gabe in terms of the size that a fish has to, you know, to be tagged, but will a, t will a fish actually ever make it to that length? Because we have lakes that show that over the seven, eight years old, they really never make it to eight inches or 10 inches just because of how productive it is. Because they don't really know that they're trying to get to a certain size. Yeah. They just know that they can grow and they can you know use that lake to their, their, their advantage, but they really don't know they're supposed to make it to eight right. inches or to another size. It's just what that, you know, um, lake is going to allow for that species with the species assemblage that exists in the lake. 
And then if you have a change in that assemblage and community structure, how does that trickle down in terms of how it changes the overall population? But is it like just by the age that they become, what would be the actual Yeah, what age? determines the sexual uh, maturity? Okay, gotcha. So really it's just seeing that female when we, when we look at the age at maturity and when we say those eggs in that body is this mature. There's no real other way other than the eggs telling us how mature they are and then we relate that back to how big that fish is at the time that we captured in that system. And, and those are some things that aren't done frequently because we do have to, you know, harvest the fish and, you know, uh, do that. But we try to do that at the same time we do age and growth, find, you know, some levels of maturation. But we do base it a lot on, you know, the literature that's available for most systems because um, it might not be available for all systems. So we can kind of work that back to the mortality to say that, they, they're going to start to see a descending limb at age two, at age three. If 50% of the population is females, then we need to get them 50% mature to this size. So it, it, it's really not a cut and dry method other than putting all those pieces together for that one particular lake. I know like Crop and Forever, we're, we're tagging fish. I've been tagging fish for just about a year now for them as well. What kind of information that makes you excited receiving from Cropter Forever? What, what do you say, man, I'm so glad I'm getting this kind of stuff from these guys. How, how are you benefiting from Cropter Forever tagging? Well, I, I think we benefit first by having a communication and a platform of common ground of what are the goals, and that's for sustainability of, of crappy populations. So by having more people, more eyes out there, similar to really any citizen science-based project, you know, where, you know, anyone that's interested says, we have this data available and here's, here's what we're doing, you know, and Gabe having that out there and transparent and saying, hey, this is what the rules are. This is what the criteria are for this to happen. And then this is what the results are. It's, it's, it's a very similar to a research project. We're asking the questions. He asked the question about, can they get any bigger? So with those tags, can they grow out any bigger? And how long can they be? How, you know, do you see them again at 16 inches? Do you see them again at 18 inches? Um, or is the mortality rate actually also saying you're not seeing those tags? And so we didn't expect to see those tags. And so that mortality rate that we estimated is actually in line with what we, you know, kind of thought about. So it's just difficult with tagging projects. A lot of times it's high mortality rates, high harvest rates, not necessarily getting the right information back, whether you cut the tag, you keep the tag in, those types of things. Communicating that with the public is very important to get that data back in a reliable fashion. But it's still important to have the tags out there, get the numbers, and keep sharing that data. That's why we did the, the Mississippi project. That's why we have the reward associated with it right so to try to encourage you know letting yep. it go and at the very least you know giving us the info right. when it was harvested right and then the opportunity to know that that project is ongoing that there are tag fish out there what to do when we were to intercept them you know having that all on the front end and the leading edge of that it's only going to help and benefit that the care and concern for the well-being of these populations is important um, a lot of times we just have a lot of fish species that are out there that are also deemed important, but, you know, it's all important when it comes to angling and getting the angler out there and, and fishing together, learning together, and keeping the sport uh, and the opportunities to, to keep going. I mean, that's my job is to help with the angling opportunity uh, for the anglers. And then if it becomes specific to crappie, if it's bass, if it's catfish, whatever that might be, those questions come our way and we do our very best to try to figure it out for that system. And tagging information just goes way down deep into that. We can't do that everywhere. Um, but the opportunity to do it certainly is based on some criteria that you've set. So what our goals is to somehow say, well, will those be populations that will benefit from a tagging program on the site? Uh, or what, what might we be able to do better with those resources in another system? So just having the learning process here together I mean, we've only known each other for just a short period of time and come over here and shake your hand and the next thing I know I'm on crappy connection. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I mean, so, you know, those are, those are, that's how this process works is the networking and communication. 
And then as we get down in the details of things, you know, it could be different in, depending on where you go. Hmm. I know uh, what kind of throws it out for myself uh, would be, you know, say if we've got 100 tags out and all of a sudden by the next year he, he's received 70 of them back. That would be a big light bulb in my mind that there's a lot of fish getting taken out really quick. Well, and again, as, as he's got the criteria set, you know, did you, did, did you release the fish or did you harvest the fish? Mm -hmm. And so to get to that, to your question, you know, is still to step back to that criteria of they release the fish, so does that classify as harvest? Really, it doesn't. It's released yeah. the fish. So even though 70 tags are reported, how many of those are released tags and how many of those are harvest tags? So yeah. there's, there's, there's some more, you know, to get to that answer, we need to, you know, each one of those steps along the line. And that's why we appreciate the criteria set tag or video tag release oh, i'm sorry video measure weigh, weight and tag yeah. and release all at this i mean that's doing you know that's that's quite a bit of activity going on there so you know but to your point is that's what we look at too is response rate that's another thing high reward versus low reward oftentimes some people don't even you know, reply if it's a $5 tag, but if it's a $100 tag, then we'll get a response rate. Mm. So those are some of the things we want to work with is talking about these, you know, when we come to that criteria and the data that you're receiving, how do you interpret that initial number of returns? So that's, that's really neat. I mean, that's why we want to work together here is to yeah. refine right. and do better and be like, what is this stuff telling us? Gabe, okay, I want to know now, what all states are you in right now as far as your tags? And, and what programs are you actively working on? We've got the, the main one that we started, like you said, about a year ago in Mississippi. And then uh, we've got some great guys on Darbone in Farmville that we're about to start. Uh, the biologists down there wanted us to wait until like October, or at least until it started cooling off a little bit just to help right. with stress. And so they're about to start tagging down there. Uh, just if that's going to be just on Darbo and that's not going to be a reward program but that's just going to be they're going to be tagging probably I think like nine to 12 inch fish or something like that okay. and just start looking at you know travel they're, they're very interested in travel yep. they're very interested in, in growth rates yep. and stuff so that's why we said you know maybe tag some nine inch fish some smaller fish and see once those fish start getting caught you know a year later how much bigger are they and you know that kind of stuff uh we're about to start also uh, on Kentucky Lake in Kentucky. Mark Riddle with Cornfield is heading up a deal up there. Uh, that's how I talked to Adam and yep. then talked to you. Uh, so that's probably going to start hopefully in the spring. And then that'll be all right now. But uh, I'm hoping to get something going out there with, with uh, Kevin in mm -hmm. North Carolina. Kevin Blevins, who you know. Yeah. You know, those guys, uh, that bunch of guys out there is a great bunch of guys. And they're wanting to. To work on something out there so we're going i don't know if it's going to be tagging i don't know what it's going to be we're going to start something out there too what's the all right I, i'm out in the lake wherever it might be and i catch a tag fish tell me the process that that angler needs to do w what are you asking from that angler so in mississippi my phone number is on the tags oh wow so <laughs> so they can call me but i i'm going to need a text anyways with the video release to to be able to qualify for the reward but, uh, you know, we just want the, if they'll give us the general area or specific area, some guys don't want to give that info up, right. which is fine. Uh, but we like to have that and then the length and the weight and then obviously the, the video of the release. And, it, you know, they have to text that to me. But, uh, and then obviously the tag number. So uh, Ronnie Turner, his, the, he's the phone number on the Lake Darbone tags. Yeah. So he's going to be the guy that's getting all the info. And they're going to have, we have a, uh, on our website, all our tagging info's there. So there's the tagging program, and that goes to the Mississippi deal. Then we're going to have a Darbone section. That you just, all you have to do is click on each tab, and you can go to the, it'll be a, a uh, Excel spreadsheet, basically, with the number and the weight and all the info on it. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll it's cool. I'm so proud to be a part of it as well. And, you know, guys watching, listening, 
they have some great products as well from sun hoodies to caps and if you want to support even if you're not in this area that tag is going on at this point but you're wanting to support this kind of movement and this kind of uh, protection research what have you look up croppyforever.com order your hat order your t-shirt even if, you know they're doing all of our apparel and yeah, all got... of our hats as well so mm. we definitely you know I've always tell people in the crappie fishing industry, we've got to support each other. We've got to support what's going to support the industry, and this is definitely an uh, avenue that's going to support and the sport. Every cent that we make from this stuff goes yep. into this. We don't we don't make any money. <laughs> right. It's a labor <laughs> so, of love. Come yeah. <laughs> so, you know, to habitat stuff, habitat programs and these tagging programs and that kind of stuff, everything we make off of these hats and shirts and stuff, all, all goes back into that stuff. Well, I mean, I definitely was excited to meet Kevin today. He, he probably, like I said, he kind of got bum rushed. Blindsided. I, I knew when he was a biologist. You know, everybody loves hearing this kind of thing, and I think it's really important. So it, it I stashed is. him real quick. It, well, I really, really appreciate the opportunity. And there's folks here from Alabama uh, Department of Conservation as well. Yep. You know, and trying to open that door and those networking opportunities um, for anglers to reach out to their biologists and talk to them about their concerns, what's going. And a lot of times we get the concerns. We don't necessarily get the what's going good. Um, you know, so, um, you know, if things are going good, you know, let, let uh, the, the, those in that area uh, be aware that you're out there and enjoying that um, opportunity. Working together is really what it comes down to, collaboration, partnerships, um, and, and the angler is really what drives me being here today, y'all being here today, right. and then that resource then benefits from that passion and commitment to this resource. It's really big. So. And that was, you know, one of the things we said from the beginning is before we started meeting guys like you, you know, we said we wanted to be transparent with everything that we found, even if something we were saying was wrong, you know, yeah. we, want, we, want, we want it to be right. And, you know, having this information public is, you know, we want to help you guys because I know, you know, uh, resources for studies and things like that aren't just abundant for state agencies and things like that. So we want to, you know, if this helps in any way make decisions, you right. know, that's what we wanted out there. Right, and and to get on that front end and whichever state that you're going into, and mm -hmm. you've reached out and made those discussions so that there's opportunity of what is the purpose of this, what are the objectives. Oh, okay, you know, because many a times we see just a tag out there, and we're like, where did this come from? I mean, there's no numbers, there's no nothing out there, right? So y'all are doing the right thing by communicating and saying, here's here's what we're trying to do. We recognize that maybe the resources aren't the greatest, um, you know. Because because it is spread thin. It is, uh, you know, various other species out there as well. But um, this is such a great opportunity. And to see y'all uh, rise this level and share information and take opportunities to connect people, um, that's really what it's all about. So thank you very much for having the opportunity to be here today. Well, I definitely appreciate both you guys. Make sure you like, subscribe, follow. Check out crappieforever.com. And uh, see you guys next time. You got Brad Chapel here. Gabe Sewell. Kevin Dockendorf, thank you all very much. Thanks. Hola. Out of my front, big muddy river, a place I'll always remember. Kevin on the lake and a fishing pole. Forever here, I'll rest my soul. I can be